There you go. And we'll start the webinar. Hello and good morning and welcome to this Jersey Chamber of Commerce Husting, uh, which is online uh, so that we can uh, record it for our YouTube channel, the Jersey Chamber of Commerce YouTube channel, and make sure that the Jersey Chamber of Commerce members can find out exactly what the candidates of St. Helier Central have to say about their constituency and what they hope they could deliver. Now you'll see on the screen at the moment, we have four candidates of those. Uh, we're hoping that uh, Nick McCornu may join us, who's registered for this. Um, we have uh, Karina Alves, Catherine Curtis and Jeff Southern and Rob Warm Ward, all representing uh, reform, as is Lindsay. And Lindsay will be representing re reform in this. There's only one from each party represented. Uh, and uh, we've uh, also got uh, Chris Tangy standing in this constituency as well. We'll see if others uh, join us as they go, uh, but if you are joining us online to watch this, then there is a Q&A box at the bottom, which you can put a question in at any time, and we'll try and weave that into our conversation between now and the next hour and 15 minutes, which does fly by. So to a two minute opener from each of our candidates, and I'll take them very much in the order that I see them on my screen at the moment, and then we'll jumble up the order as we go through the questions. So John Baker first, two minutes from your good self. Okay, I'm, I'm John Baker. I'm a Jersey-born um, independent candidate who lives and works in St. Helia. I've worked voluntarily for the parish for over 30 years. I'm very passionate about uh, the, um, sorry, about improving the lives of the residents of St. Helia. I'm not tied or affiliated to any party, but stand on my own principles, which include making St. Helia a more pleasant place in which to live and work both uh, better facilities, particularly for families and young people, more nurseries and schools, open spaces, pocket parks and playgrounds, greener, cleaner streets with safe areas for children to play. The town should be a safe place to walk through at any time of day. The town needs improved transport links, frequent hopper bus services, a park and ride facility, better routes for cyclists and safer routes for children to walk and cycle to school. Our dependency on the car has reached unmanageable proportions. The amount of traffic that passes through our town causes continuous pollution and increases respiratory problems in the young. We need to consider greener methods of transport for people of all ages and abilities. We need better car parking facilities on the outskirts of town, for, particularly for shoppers. We must extend the Millennium Town Park, as you see behind me, and improve facilities for young children. From an island's point of view, we must do more to protect our environment and its biodiversity. It is essential that we look at renewable energy alternatives to fossil fuels and sustainable forms of transport, such as electric and hydrogen powered vehicles. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, in one minute, 44. Uh, a yep. good two minutes worth. Uh, so uh, thank you for that. We'll move to uh, Lindsay Felton representing the Reform Party and uh, a candidate in this constituency. Your two minutes, Lindsay. Hello, I'm Lindsay Feltham, Chairperson of Reform Jersey and one of our five candidates in St. Helier Central. Our other candidates are Karina Alves, Catherine Curtis, Jeff Southern and Rob Ward. Between us, we have a wealth of experience across the public and private sector, in government and in scrutiny. And we are a team that will work together for the benefit of people living in St Helier Central. As all managers know, having a good team around you to work with makes it easier to achieve things. As party chairperson, I am incredibly proud of the team of 14 candidates that we have put together to contest seats across seven constituencies. We are committed to delivering for the benefit of all islanders and a team that includes experienced business owners, teachers, project managers and IT specialists. We are a diverse group that has come together to produce a manifesto that addresses the major concerns of islanders, which include housing, education, population, healthcare, environmental sustainability and an economy that works for all. As we recover from the pandemic, we need a government that is willing to act to ensure that Islanders are able to maintain a good standard of living and that jobs are protected. The business community plays a key role in providing both services and jobs to local people, as well as income generation for the island. 
As more and more people leave the island due to the increased cost of living and shortage of suitable accommodation, businesses are struggling with staff shortages. It is important that government works with business leaders to identify skills gaps, provide relevant retraining and upskilling where required, and effectively manage migration through a permit system that enables the workers that we need to come to the island and live a good life. Please read our key pledges and broader manifesto on our website, reformjersey.je. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, one minute, 59.27. Uh, I'm keeping this core of how I can. That is the closest to two minutes we've had in all of the hustings so far. Uh, it's impressive. Get a job in broadcasting if you can talk to time. Uh, let's move from that. And we've got questions coming in already, but we'll, we'll come to those in a moment. We're on the two minute round at the moment. Uh, Julie Wallman, it's to you. My name is Julie Wallman, and I'm a Jersey Liberal Conservative in coalition with the Progress Party. My district is St Helier Central. There are no sound bites to this two minutes. We must stop wasting money. We've got to stop vanity projects. We've got to listen to the people on the ground. I have spent the last three to four weeks doing just that, talking to people and listening to them. I have already been actioning things that need to be done. Those people know what's been done already. This party with the coalition together, the Progress Party with JLC, are action. We've got to listen to the people on this island. We have a wonderful park in St. Helier Central. We've got amazing businesses that are all saying the same thing, which is what I'm saying right now to everybody. We are a party of action. We are a party to support the people and give them the opportunities that we as an island deserve to give them. If I am elected, my role is to serve the people and to go through this magic document, page by page by page. It is not a report to be left on the shelf, gathering dust. It is a report that will be actioned and that is a promise from me. My other promise to all the people in St Helier Central is this. I will spend one to two days every day of the week walking the streets, talking to the people of St Helier Central and ensuring that, that, that this party, JLC, with the Progress Party, listen and action. Thank you. Muted. Apologies. Yes, I was muted. I mm -hmm. muted, unmuted and muted myself again. Apologies. Thank you, Julie. Uh, and thank, thank you. you. And I, I should, of course, have uh, prefaced that with uh, Jersey Liberal Conservative Progress Party. I do apologise. Uh, thank thank you. you very much indeed. Uh, and we move to Neil Kilby for your two minutes. Neil. Hello, everybody. I'm Neil Kilby. I'm an independent, uh, which I think is extremely important. First thing I want to say is please vote. Uh, the state of Jersey is a £1 billion a year business. It takes in £1 billion in taxation, close enough, and spends nearly all of it. So if we look at that as 100,000 people on the island, that's roughly £10,000 for every single person and child on the island. So it is important you use your vote. Please use it. If you live 80 years on the island, that's £800,000. It's the largest expenditure you will singularly make. So I'm standing for St Helia Central, uh, very much what uh, John and uh, Leslie have been saying, uh, Lindsay have been saying there, we need to make sure that St Helia Central is a good place to live, lots of greenery, lots of space for people to congregate. Uh, I, I like to see it more multi-generational, I see we have age concern and youth clubs, I think that we should have people together, um, but that's, that's a, a minute issue. The, the next thing is in terms of the states itself, the state's chamber should have primacy over the whole of the state's uh, machinery. We, and those state's members are trustees and directors as they would be in a company. They should be responsible on the same basis. The business, uh, the states of Jersey itself needs to operate on a business discipline level. So especially the chamber, we, we've seen lots of things going on that uh, project appraisal has just been ignored. It's just been done on a uh, basis where we've ended up with a hundred million pounds spent on a hospital project. 
I'd like to see the government work in partnership with business and the third sector. There is housing available if we search it out properly. There's approximately 2,000 uh, dwellings available uh, on brown sites. And I'd just like to, everybody to remember that the broader economy of the finance sector and smaller businesses are the engine room. We'll catch you some slack on the five seconds there, but thank you very much, Neil. That's neither here nor there. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you to our candidates there. Just a reminder to you, this is uh, St. Helia Central, and uh, there are some candidates who are not with us. We've already mentioned those. We've got questions that are coming in as well. Um, the first question that I want to raise, and we did this at the last hosting as well, and it was a really interesting point. Uh, we, and, and Neil has got independent boldly put up there. We've got two party candidates here and two independent candidates on the screen. Um, and uh, notably, Reform have uh, several candidates. One, two, three, four. How many have you got? Have you got five? five yes, we candidates. have five. You have five candidates in one constituency. Um, so, OK, uh, let, let's come to you first, Lindsay. Um, why a political party? You're chairman, so you're bound to be well versed in this. Why is a political party better for the voter than an independent? Uh, that is a very good question. Um, if Thank you'd you. asked me 20 years ago, I would have said to you, I would have always been an independent member of the States. Um, I then went to go and live and work in Australia for 11 years. I'm a public servant and I've worked under a party political system. Now, what I realised um, with that was that actually it's if, when, when you get a party going into um, government and they have a clear manifesto, you don't spend a year coming up with a government plan, which is what happened in 2018. What you've got is a clear plan of action that is then given to the civil service, the public sector, um, to implement. And implementation is a lot quicker. Also, people know what they're voting for. Um, with independents, I've spoken to constituents and they've been disappointed sometimes with um, how some independents have voted. Um, whereas we've actually got our manifesto, which is what we very much see as our contract with the voter, our contract with the electorate. We've also got each other to um, keep it, keep it each other, you know, on track and on side. And as I said um, in my opening, I think it's really important to work in a team and a team that can deliver effectively. And I gain a lot from our other party members and the experiences that they have, because no single person can be experienced in every single area. Okay, thank you, thank you for that, uh, John. I'm going to come to you on this. You're an independent candidate. Um, was there a thought for you to uh, join a political party? Did you did you check out the competition and think which one am I best aligned to, or were you always going to be uh, swimming your own race? I was approached um, by, by by some parties, and uh, I really wasn't interested. I mean, as far as Chelsea is concerned, parties have been tried in the past. I mean, 200 years ago and 100 years ago. You know, in, re in, in living memory, there's been parties in Jersey that came and went. I think Jersey's just a very different place and parties are not really suited. I don't think the, the current situation is going to end up with, with, you know, a government that's run by a single party. They haven't got the strength. Uh, and if you talk about parties, just look at the UK and look at the shenanigans between the Conservatives and the Labour parties. They, they just end up spending their time fighting each other instead of getting on and doing stuff. I mean, myself and Neil are actually working together. We, we go out together and canvas and, and we put the posters up together. So that's, that's a sort of a spirit of cooperation. And I can work with anybody and I'd be pleased to work with anybody, you know, whether I get into government or as a, as a backbencher. But I've got lots of, of, of ideas, but those ideas, you know, are probably um, also comprehensive ideas that are shared by a number of, of, of parties. We want the best for the town, the best for Jersey. And, you know, my thoughts are to, to green uh, and make better facilities for, for the town, but other people will have, will have other, other thoughts. I mean, I, I will support reducing taxation. I, re, I'll, I will definitely support um, better housing, cheaper housing, and all sorts of other um, uh, okay. great ideas. Okay. So an independent can, can easy, easily support the, uh, any, any of the party principles. All right, thank you for that. Um, uh, um, Julie, coming to you next, mm. you, uh, you're, you're with a party that's now with another party. That's um, correct. So it's become a larger party. Um, uh, and you joined very much when it was Liberal Conservative before it joined with Progress Party. Absolutely. What's the benefit for you in a party? What's we're a group. We're, we're very much a team and we all have voices that are very similar. So if you put those voices together, 
you create a fantastic group of people with action points that will get done. I feel going in as an independent, there's been some great people that have tried. They can't get things through. So coming in with J um, JLC and the Progress team, as a group, we are stronger and things will get done. And I think as an island, we really need to get moving on, on the really important issues on this island. So that's why I went straight with JLC. And then of course we created the coalition, but you know, where that takes us, who knows? But for now, we're a very strong group and we have our meetings at HQ. We know what we're doing. We have our action points. We've got our manifesto, which very has been an awful lot of thoughts gone into it. So, you know, we have a vision and we have a plan. And I think Jersey needs to have a plan now and we need to get things done. Right. Uh, we are getting some stuff done today, which is the husting for um, St. Helia Central and Neil Kilby. Uh, the, the similar question to you. Uh, you. You and John have been putting posters up together, but I'm assuming there are differences between uh, what you believe and what John believes. Um, as, as independent as can be, free, free spirit and free thinking? Uh, free spirit? I don't know what you're asking now. Um, what, I, what I would say is that first of all, the States Assembly should be considered as a board of directors running a large organization. So we should have quality people in there who understand how that they are running a billion dollar business to start off with. And the 50 of them should work together to give a unit, uh, unified voice to the state's machinery itself. So in terms of why I'm an independent, I think that 50 people should be able to get together and sort not knock heads together and sort stuff out and come up with the, uh, the 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 policies and the direction that we want to give to the state's machinery. So that's that's why I'm an independent. Uh, there's there's all, all parties have got good things to say, all of them. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm a lot of what the social uh, issues that reform are bringing up need to be addressed, but they have been addressed over previous years without parties. So we we, we need to address those issues. But we also need to stand in place for uh, for people, uh, small businesses, which don't seem to be getting the support they should be. The broader economy really, really needs to be looked after. So as far as I'm concerned, I, I think I can stand my own as an independent. Uh, I hope you do, do as well. Um, and I don't see that there's any single party that is going to gain enough single votes that it can run through a manifesto as such as the, the uh, governments in the UK do. So I think it's more important that 50 people work together for the unity, for, uh, for the best of Jersey. Right, let's talk about St. Helia Central. Let's talk about the business community. This is the Jersey Chamber of Commerce hosting after all. Um, and being uh, a, a, attractive to the voter in a business friendly way, um, St. Helia Central, really crucial, um, real uh, income driver uh, to the economy, a wealth creator to the economy. So let's let's look at uh, what you as independents or parties are going to do for business. Um, John, I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to start with you. You, you. you talked about transport and overuse on the car. And yet most people work in St. Helier and most people can't take uh, a full week shopping home uh, on, on the back of a bike. So. Um, how do we square that circle? Because there'll be many businesses getting very, very twitchy about a candidate that says, what we've got to do is stop the car coming into St. Helier. They've had that fight for a long time. No, I don't think I said that. But you, I mean, you, you, you certainly realise that the overuse of the car worldwide, you know, all, all, all of um, the developed countries now have found that city centres uh, work better, freer of cars. I've been to the UK during lockdown and I've seen many great uh, cities, places like Oxford, that have got the actual centre of the town free of, of, of transport. So you get rid of the pollution, you get rid of the gridlock, but you put good methods of transport in. You, you know, the days when you could drive up to the front of Voisin's department store, drop the wife off and go and pick her up later with the shopping. You know, that's, that's, that's back in the 40s and the 50s. We've moved on since then. And yeah, um, what we need is we need we need better access, but we need better car parks and access to those car parks. And yeah, yeah, the, um, you know, as far as central is concerned, unfortunately, we, we we don't take in my end of the uh, uh, of Saint Helier, which is um, you know King Street is actually in the southern district, not in central. 
So most of the thriving uh, commercial activity is, is, is actually not in our districts, it's to the south. Central is more residential. It's more the, the heart of St. Helia, and it's the area that really needs to be free of, of, of having streets full of cars and have more green space. I'd like to get to the stage where a family brings the kids home from school and says, right, we've got 15 minutes, what can we do? Can we take the kids outside? And you look out in the street, it's just full of cars and pollution. And they'd have to travel 10 or 15 minutes to get to a park. Well, you know, they haven't got that time. If they've only got 15 minutes, by the time they get to the park, it's time to come back. So as well as the beautiful Millennium Park, which I'd like to see extended, and we've got the, on the other side of town, we've got so obviously People's Park and the Parade, but we need more, more open spaces in the middle. Now, the whole principle, getting back to your question, is to make the town more attractive for everybody. And if the town is more attractive, more people will come into town. And that's the principle of helping businesses to, to develop the town into a nicer place to live and to work. And the people that work in St. Helia will, will really appreciate you know, that they, their free time outside of work is, is in a happy, um, comfortable environment. OK, thank you, John. Uh, a populous area, uh, Julie, um, an area where a great deal, as John rightly said, uh, live um, and work because it's right on their doorstep. Uh, what can we do to make this a better environment? John has outlined some some points there, uh, presumably the points that you will support as well. Uh, but what, what's what's your big idea from your party? Well, with the Millennium Park, for sure, greener space, and we'd love to see that extended. Um, people in the countryside do respect the town. You know, people can make these decisions. Let's go to town, let's take one car, not two. You know, we've got to let people be responsible enough to sit down as groups and say the town and the countryside need to both be respected, the people living them both be respected. And as a party, as a group, we believe that people are old enough and bold enough to make those decisions. And we can start small as groups of families and friends and say, yes, I want to go into town. I won't, two of us won't bring our car, one of us will. That's one big change. It's getting the mindset to change, but to be respectful of both the countryside and the town. It won't happen overnight. It's gonna take time. And I believe with our action plan in our manifesto, which everyone is entitled to look at, jlc .j, uh, sorry, jlc.je, um, it's very clear what our party policy is. We want people to have comfortable lifestyles, to live and breathe the air. I have a weak lung, you know, but I know that people have to come into town to work and they have to do things. But as an island, nine by five, as a community, we can all start making these decisions as a whole. And I do believe that the countryside and the town together can respect each other's areas and to really see how we can all find solutions together moving forward. But we've got to get on with it. We've got to do it now. Neil, um, the, the area of uh, central uh, St. Helier and its environment in, in terms of, and, and again, I, I, go, I go back to the business. There are, I take your point, John, but there are, there are businesses within this area, small businesses particularly. And you, you did mention small businesses before. Um, how, do we, how do we support these small businesses in, St. Helier Central, what needs to be done? Well, 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 the first issue is there are just not enough people to do the work. I, I, I have uh, uh, some shopkeepers next door to me. Uh, they're they're walk, working 14 hours a day, six, seven days a week, because they just simply don't have the staff. They're the, the employee of last resort. If they were an employee in somebody else's business, they'd be straight round to Jack's. There would be unions behind them. There would be absolutely you know, screw it and an outcry. But it's their personal business, so they're not, they have to survive by themselves. Uh, but they just simply need people. That's the first, first words that come out of anybody's mouth in tourism, shops, uh, any businesses. Please, can we have some people? So that's, that's the first thing. Second thing, I think that um, a, a lot of businesses, uh, especially in the town centre, are, are operating some way back in time. The, the, Market is uh, still running on market uh, timings that were, uh, I think there were 1800s, 1900s, and a lot of people are hoping that we will still have a busy shop, uh, uh, shops uh, like we did when we had 30,000 visitors a week during the height of the tourism. 
we're not there anymore. We've got massive competition from uh, online businesses and we need to make St. Helier Central a very attractive, sorry, St. Helier itself, the retail area of St. Helier itself, an attractive place to be, having to compete with online, not just sort of saying, oh, well, we, 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 we should just stop them from coming in. We need to get modern. We need to be open when uh, people are free. It's, you know, we, we are basically running offices hours for offices and office hours for shops. Just doesn't make any logical sense. Um, so, we, we, you know, we, we need to drag ourselves into this 21st century where there are endless brilliant opportunities, but we're, not, we're, we're stuck in the past. So I'd like to see, you know, St. Helier uh, Central Market would be a fabulous place as a sort of uh, eating mall and with entertainment. So just uh, ideas and opportunities like that just need to be brought forward. There's hundreds of Mary Porters would sort us out in five minutes. OK, so uh, it, it's, it's not my ideas and I'm not proud of them. I'm just saying, let's get let's find some ways to make this an exciting shopping centre and a green place to live. I, I personally think there's too many cars on the island, but we've got to get a better option, not just say you can't have cars. You've got to have better options. Neil, thank you very much indeed uh, for your uh your tuppence worth on that. We'll come back, I fear, to Central Market very shortly, uh, as well as housing. Um, and other questions are coming in as well. Um, and so employees as well and recruitment, those are all on the list and we've got questions coming in on those as we speak. Um, so, Lindsay, uh, reform and uh, St. Helia Central, um, by the amount of uh, candidates you put forward, you see this as a reform stronghold. Um, and I ju I'm just using the numbers of the candidates you've got as an example of that. Um, business friendly reform, the two don't often seem to align to each other. Uh, how can you convince business voters that reform is the party that they should support? Um, I think it's interesting, again, that you say that, Murray, but, and I, I, I wonder what backs that up, whether it's just actually a rumour that goes around that we're anti-business because we're not. Um, we're very much pro-people and pro-jobs. People want people need jobs um, and they also need the services that business provides to us. We also need the income um, into the island that business uh, derives via export as well. So we're absolutely not anti-business. Um, with regards to um, businesses in particular in St Helia Central, um, like, like has been said earlier, uh, lots of them tend to be small businesses. We've got lots of hairdresser, hairdressers, um, beauty businesses and also restaurants and bars and things like that so I think there's there's a lot that can be done to reduce red tape for businesses and we would be very pro that um, and also looking at um, ad advancing the evening economy in St Helia Central at the moment um, lots of businesses um, in the district will be losing out on potential income because the opera house is closed so lots of restaurants in in the area may well be um, missing out on that pre-theatre dining and things like that so getting things like the opera house up and running would actually help small business as well. Um, I think it's very key that we would work with um, organisations such as the Chamber and Jersey Business to listen um, to what the real concerns of the business sector are um, and local businesses and work together with you on that. Um, but absolutely not anti-business, Murray. I would uh, I would add that the um, uh, the uh, the minister with responsibility for most of the last four years for the Opera House uh, is a, a reform candidate. Um, I, I just wanted to add that in as well, just for a little bit of extra spice. Uh, but I, I I do concur with you. It would be good to get the Opera House open. Um, so uh, can I just come back on that because yeah, that sure. that particular minister had to step away from being a minister in order to secure the additional funding for the arts and cultural sector, because in the ministerial position, he was unable to do that. And that's absolutely why we need a reformed Jersey government. I asked for that and I got it. There you go. Thank you very much indeed for that. Um, the, the question that I wanted to, I, I, I'll come back again, but we're not gonna get into an argument about that right now. Um, uh, there are questions about housing and uh, lots of questions come in. Now, housing is, really central to central St. Helier, but it's also central to recruitment and population management. It's one of those big strands. 
So in terms of housing, we are short of housing. We're short of housing so that we can employ people. We're short of housing for young families. We're short of housing for just about everyone. Uh, the uh, shoulder is, uh, the burden is very much on the shoulder of St. Helier uh, to house more people than anyone else. Uh, so how do you improve housing within your constituency? Um, I, I, I'll come to you in a second, John. I, I'm going to come to you first, Neil, because we haven't had you start one of these questions yet. So in terms of housing in your area and in St. Helier in general, if I may, um, how do we provide more housing? Because there is certainly a housing crisis. Um, well, first of all, uh, we, we were all at the Construction Council. I thought so most of us were at the Construction Council meeting uh, yesterday morning. And uh, I, I spoke with various different people within the industry and within the social uh, housing provision people. Uh, and the, the general consensus is that there's a roughly enough space on brownfield sites in Jersey for 2,000 dwellings. Uh, that's property owned by the states of Jersey itself. OK, so we need, first of all, you know, we do need we do need properties. We need properties of all different types. Um, I am concerned that most people use housing as a, as a giant coverall. Some people meaning that they want to buy a house and get on the property ladder and other people meaning that they just want shelter for themselves and their, their kids. That's a reasonable size. Two totally different uh, issues. But the uh, there is two thousand dwellings available which is in within our remit uh, if we have a unified house that goes for it and directs the states of Jersey properly we should be able to get 2,000 houses on brownfield sites or 2,000 uh, dwellings on brownfield sites. Um, there, is, there does seem to be a focus at the moment on investment properties I see lots and lots of flats going up uh, but they don't appear to be resolving any problem in terms of housing so that is a concern I would like to know what's going on there. Um, but yeah, the, there's there's lots that can be done, and it, it, it seems that we we are not making it happen. If there's two thousand dwellings available to go on brownfield sites, if if we just get it organised, so that's where I am at the moment. Okay, thank you, uh, Lindsay. Um, housing uh, a perennial issue, more so in the last three four years. Supply and demand have, have, have brought us to the point that we're at at the moment. How do we solve this quickly? Uh, Reform Jersey has a housing crisis action plan, which if we were to go into government, we would instruct officers to um, put, put forward as a matter of urgency. Um, what we want to do is get disused properties back onto the market, so particularly empty properties that are currently not being used. We also want to ensure that uh, any state's owned land is developed for affordable housing as well. Um, there's also lots of state's owned properties that's currently underused and, and, and needs sorting out. So I walk past Westaway Court on a daily basis and I look at um, St. Helia House, which is owned by the parish as well. And I know that there are plans there with Andium to look at that. Um, what also concerns us is the standard of living and the standard of accommodation. So a landlord licensing scheme is very important to us. I mean, just walking around some of the accommodation as we've been canvassing, um, it's quite clear that um, some accommodation is, is not fit for purpose. So that, that needs to be brought up to standard through appropriate regulation as well. And to bring that back to business, you know, for business owners um, and managers, it's really important that your staff are living in accommodation that is um, safe, appropriate, and that when they come to work, you know, they're feeling well rested and relaxed so they can get on with their, with their job. Um, so I think housing is important in more ways than one. Lindsay, thank you. Um, let's go to John. John, um, housing, uh, you've got a lovely green area picture behind you, but there's one thing for certain, we, we, we do need to resolve the housing issue before we can all enjoy the outdoors. Well, in, in fact, Andrew had some great plans to extend the park and put some more apartments here. Uh, and that was, that, that was turned down, sadly, a, a long story I won't go into. As Lindsay points out, there's, there's, there's a problem with the number of vacant properties. In fact, there's over 4,000 vacant properties in, in the whole of, of Jersey. Now, some of those are people moving in transit, etc. But I know specifically, and I won't mention where, uh, of, of apartments, luxury apartments that were bought and left empty for years. I mean, I'm not talking about a few years, tens, 20 years. Um, so there's lots of those 4,000 that, that could either be seconded or, be, or through tax measures 
you know, in, in terms of improving, um, extending property taxes, as happens, in fact, in, in Cornwall and in Wales, where people have their holiday homes that affect the local housing market, they are given three and four times the amount of local taxes to discourage them from keeping empty properties. But it, we have to blame previous governments for the lack of a sustainable population policy that's partly caused this crisis. But we've also got the situation that we have quangos such as SOJDC just building luxury accommodation. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is just bought for investment, and some of it is bought by overseas um, investors. Next door to me, where I live down on the waterfront, we've got Horizon development go going up. That's been sold now, most of the you know pre-sold pre before it's actually been built. But these are all luxury apartments. There's no social housing there. The SOJDC, the States of Jersey Development Company, should be forced to build a proportion, maybe 50% of social housing within their developments. South Hill has been turned down at the moment. Uh, their plans for, for a number of flights there. It's a, it's a, it, was a good, it was a good design, but it did include a, a large enough element of social housing. Uh, so the government needs to do a lot more. It needs to control the population and it needs to concentrate more on developing social housing and also in, improve the builder methods. Those, some of the ideas discussed at the Design Council yesterday were faster ways of building. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, uh, Julia, we get down to you on uh, the subject of housing. Uh, and again, some of the subjects may have been covered here. You may want to elaborate on some of them, but uh, how, do you, uh, how do you and your party parties uh, yeah. attempt to uh, solve the housing crisis? So the rental market is the one that's very clear in our manifesto. And two areas that we really want to look at is the landlord register, that there must be one, and a tenant's anonymous helpline. I've been on the ground on two or three occasions with friends um, that have unqualified uh, rental flats, and they've been afraid to ring up, they've been afraid to say anything. So the two key areas for rental would be a landlord's register, and an anonymous helpline for any tenant. And that once that tenant has any issues, that they are actioned straight away. These, this is the first area, which is the rental accommodation, because this is one strong area as much as people wanting to buy a property. The second area are the brownfields. And I, and I do completely agree, we do have brownfields that, that should be built as housing, but we need to make sure that they are brownfields and that they're not green fields. The third area is the amount of vacant properties. I completely agree. But before we start blaming and naming, let's be very careful about the report that we do in government. And let's find out what the stories are behind these vacant properties. I do believe there are a number of them, even down near, near where my area is, that are vacant and have been vacant since 1970. So let's look at this report and let's, before we start naming and blaming people about having this, that and the other, let's get a report, let's action the findings and let's find out about who these people are that have these vacant properties and if there's any way we can resolve it before we start throwing names here, there and everywhere. So I hope that answers the question. It's a big problem housing. We also need to make sure that qualified and unqualified properties are of the same quality, that whether you're qualified or unqualified, you do have a right. You have a right to live in a decent property. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much for that. Um, a question that uh, was one of the leading questions that came in uh, very early on was uh, about temporary accommodation. Uh, and this, this, this now moves us into the area of recruitment. Um, and the two are, along with population, inextricably linked. And, and that is, um, we need to house people that work. And we haven't got enough people in the island uh, to cover all of the vacancies that we have. And we'll come on to talk about the economy in just a second. Um, but with regard to transient workers, if I can uh, name them as such. Um, do we need accommodation for transient workers? There was an attempt within the States um, that was brought actually by Roland Hewlin to, uh, to build temporary accommodation that uh, failed. In fact, I think there were about five votes. Um, but how do we solve the problem of uh, accommodating workers? We need workers uh, or we just start closing businesses, one or the other. So how do we house them? 
Is there a, uh, a policy or a thought for transient workers that we need to start looking at? Um, and I'll start, um, you know, I've only got four to choose from, so I don't know who to pick on first, but um, I'm, I'm gonna go to you first, Julie, on this. How do, we, how do we solve the transient workers? Well, during our hospitality hustings, I spoke to a number of businesses and they've been finding their own solutions, funny enough. Some of them have been taking on accommodation and costing it, and they've been doing it. It's been hard, but businesses do adapt. What we don't want to do is start getting all of these little temporary properties that end up, you know, where people do not have a proper quality of life. We've got to be very careful when we start saying the word temporary and that these people coming in are respected and looked after. So I think we need to talk to the local businesses. And I have spoken to quite a few who are adapting and trying to make things work, but government need to help them as well. So that's an area that's very strong in my mind, having spoken to people in hospitality, because hospitality, I didn't know, 80 to 100% of the food that hospitality buy in is local. So there is a win for the countryside and there's a win for the town. So I haven't really answered your question because there's no quick fix. But what, what we do not want to see is temporary accommodation that not, is not up to scratch for a human being. We've got to be careful. But that I do know, having spoken to small businesses, that they are adapting and they're adapting fast. And we as a government need to help them adapt fast. Neil, um, temporary accommodation uh, of a good standard um, the word that was bandied around at another hustings was hall of residence style. Um, mm. Is that is that something we, we could look at? Is there a policy change that we could make to help businesses? Well, well, first of all, um, I, I was at the uh, speaking to the head of the Jersey Hospitality Association. They've already got a plan. Mm. It's, it's 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 already there. They they think they can accommodate six hundred people or thereabouts in. Uh, office accommodation that has now been vacated in St. Helier itself, okay? So uh, what they believe uh, is that they need to get the red tape out of the way so that those people can, uh, can access that. Uh, as Julie was saying about business people, business people have to make things happen to survive. It's not like the states of Jersey, if you don't, if you don't, don't doesn't go well, you just get more, raise more tax. It doesn't work like that in the real world of businesses. So they're, they've survived the lockdown and they're now struggling for staff. So we do need as much people as we possibly can get in for just to keep them going. There's a basic issue of how long are the people, the permits for people to be here. Um, the nine months permit, which is, again going back to the 1970s and 80s was 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 fine then but people now need quality staff that are well trained very capable and it takes them a month or two at least to get uh, up to uh, running in their new job and to have them just for another six months or so just becomes uneconomic especially if you're bringing them in from places like barbuda so we, we do need to halls of residence i, I don't think honestly that the the people of Jersey will go, do you know what, halls of residence rather than uh, homes for ourselves, I, th I think is an unlikely scenario, okay? So working within the parameters of what is possible, we need to make sure that people who have got uh, accommodation that's empty or, or were, were renting are, are if, if I, clearly we cannot have substandard accommodation, but the needs of an 18, 19 year old for six or seven months is not the same as that for a, 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 a family uh, that, that were working on a professional basis. So there, there are different standards of accommodation we need. So we, we should be encouraging people into the sector, not scaring them off. So rent caps, uh, et cetera, we, we do need to main, maintain a standard without a shadow of a doubt. We can't have appalling accommodation, but a lot of people choose the accommodation on price, first of all, and then say, right, well, I've got it. And I think what it was, and then go, well, it's not as good as I wanted it to be. Well, you saw it. OK, so we, we can't if, if somebody's being maltreated, but they went into the contract themselves. We need to make sure that we're not entering in sort of a situation which is one sided. OK, so, uh, yes, accommodation should be good. We should be getting keep, keeping people in the market, not scaring them off. Right. Lindsay. Worker accommodation. Transient worker accommodation, temporary accommodation, call it what you will, um, accommodation for those people that we need to bring in with the skills that we don't have on island. We don't have enough of it. We need to 
create a way of doing it. Um, is there a way of doing that without scaring landlords away so they just sell up and say, oh, I'm not putting up with all of these rules and recs? I think that there is. I think that the proposition, though, that went to the state's assembly um, a few months ago wasn't the right solution um, because I, there wasn't enough confidence that it was going to be afford people a decent quality of life. And everybody that lives and works here for no matter how long deserves a decent quality of life and safe and secure accommodation. So there's a place there for landlords that are willing to to provide safe and secure accommodation um, and I was concerned particularly about the proposals that were put forward um, due to my experience in Australia where that style of accommodation is used in mining communities. Um, there are huge um, mental health um, problems um, due, arising due to that style of accommodation and um, that, that then would put further burden onto our, um, our already stressed mental health services um, and that's not something that we need. Um, coming back to your question, um, I think that we need to be working with organisations such as the Jersey Hospitality Association on medium to long term plans. Um, coming back to this year, you know, it was very last minute that we were looking at we need staff now um, to be coming in for the summer season. We need to be planning right now for the next summer season and beyond um, so that we know that we're going to have accommodation secure. I know that part of the problem um, this year has been that some of the lodging houses that were pre previously available um, have been modified and turned into um, flats and now they're no longer lodging house accommodation. So we need to be planning and looking at actually what we've got within the housing market and ensuring that we've got that market available for temporary workers, but also to pick up on those temporary permits. I think it's important to look at those timings of permits because um, ideally we'd want people staying for longer on the island. So we really need to understand um, what the actual temporary worker um, requirement is and how many people we can keep on a longer term basis. Because at the end of the day, a transient community is going to bring a lot of its own needs and potential issues because if you're not staying on the island long term you know it, it might become the party town for people who want a summer job um potentially or or it could become a, and i see you nodding there murray you remember I mean, the 80s. it certainly was in the 70s and 80s let me tell you <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah you remember the 80s um so so you know we need to think about the type of community that we're trying to build and i certainly wouldn't um support punitive measures on people and prevent them from bringing the bringing their family over and things like that. So we need to treat people with respect. Okay, we're coming into more of population in just a second, but I think it's all touching around the uh, the same subject here. Um, and to be fair, the uh, I think um, both COVID and people returning back to their country of origin and Brexit and people returning back to their country of origin where things were better and they've got more more earnings to save um, are two of the reasons that we and, and Chamber was certainly flagging that up uh, with the tourism industry for quite a long time. So I think some work or some calling has been happening for a long time uh, without much action. Uh, John, um, in terms of temporary accommodation, um, is it is it something that we need to look in more depth at? Because we're, we're certainly not solving the problem, uh, even if people can recruit they've got nowhere to house them. And that's one of the biggest problems um, in retail, in hospitality. They're finding this a real challenge. There are other industries as well. Yeah, it's one of those things that the government keeps kicking cans down the road, doesn't it? There's a problem and they talk about it, but they don't do anything about it. Uh, I think you've got to get more people in the States that, that, are, that, that are people that take, you know, that take action. And sort of the, the first thing I would, would look at, and we're talking about the hospitality industry and the building industry in the main, is the permit system. The idea that somebody can only work for, for nine months when you've got a building contract that maybe would take two years to complete. And I'm, I'm thinking about something like the hospital, because if the state's ever managed to get the funding re re reorganised, because it's going to cost a lot more than 800 million with, the, uh, with Brexit and inflation, um, you have to plan for industries to be able to accommodate uh, for, for a reasonable length of time to have these temporary workers in the island. And not just the hospital, we've got the Southwest um, master plan coming on stream with 2000 units of accommodation. We've got a hospitality industry that hopefully will be getting more tourists in now with COVID um, disappearing from, from, from our view. So I think we've got to look at um, readdressing the permit system, cutting the red tape. And then we've got to look at a way of, of taking advantage of places like Westerway Court. Westerway Court has, been, has, has remained empty for a number of years now. That could have been refurbished 
and used either by the, the doctors and nurses, or indeed it could be specifically refurbished by, for use by the contractors for, uh, eventually for the hospital build. There's lots of other uh, properties that are owned by the states that could be refurbished. And there's also places that, you know, maybe uh, hotels that are deciding that in the long term, they'd be better to apply to, um, to, to, to change to, um, to apartments, et cetera. And in the meantime, you know, these things, it takes at least a year to go through planning. So in the meantime, a lot of these, of these hotels that maybe could be, be offered some sort of deal by government, some sort of guarantees that if they hand their hotel over for the use of, of temporary accommodation, that it could be a real benefit to them. And then rather than letting the, the, the hotel run down because they think they're going to knock it down and refurbish it, you know, let's maintain it and, and use it for these, this temporary accommodation. So there's lots of solutions, but the problem is getting government to get off its proverbial and getting things moving. So permits first, and then look around at the sensible solutions. We've got the properties, we just need to have the right plans in place. Muted. Population policy is where we've gone to, uh, and say it, it was me. Uh, population policy is where we've gone to, uh, and uh, let's let's continue with that. Lindsay, I'm going to come back to you first on this. Um, in terms of the population policy, um, we've we've seen a population policy. There was one drafted 2014, 2018 that I knew particularly well. Uh, that population policy was then looked at again by the last government uh, for the last four years, and right at the very end of the last government, they put the first strands of agreement in place for that population policy. That's taken eight years so far, and we're still only with a very flexible, we haven't got down to the nitty gritty of yet. Um, firstly, have they got it right? And secondly, what do, we, what do we really need in a population policy that we haven't got? Um, I think just to touch on some of the things that we've just mentioned in the previous discussion, one thing that I don't think is right is the um, time, the time limited permit um, in, in that and what was proposed because of some of the issues that we've already discussed. But also, I think um, what the government was saying is that they didn't have enough data. Now, what we're hearing from the community at large is that they are concerned about um, population growth. We need to move towards a more stable population um, and look at how we can retain people that we already have on island and make the best use of their skills. Um, but then other people that we speak to are concerned about losing people. We've just spoken about the shortage of staff um, at length as well. So we need to balance that with um, also retaining people on island. Um, and we can do that by ensuring that they have a decent quality of life and that we look after them um, at times of crisis and when the cost of living goes up. So. Um, yeah, with regard to population um, and how we would manage that, we would prefer to move to a permit style system. I think the licensing system at the moment hasn't worked. Um, we have seen uh, population growth. And what has happened is that businesses retain, retain licenses and um, sometimes where they could recruit from um, on island, there isn't the incentive for them to do that because they have that license there ready to use. So there's some thinking that we need to do around that. And that's why we, we prefer a permit situation where we look at the skill set of the people that we require on island so that we can bring over people that um, meet the needs of business and also the public sector as well. Um, am I am I thinking and uh, noting your background? Am I thinking of very much like an Australian system, a permit system, where where there's a point system where you we we we've got people in certain maybe not points, but but certainly yeah. we've got levers to pull. Um, yes, just so I can understand that. That that that's right. It's about understanding. Okay, where do we need skills, and then um, encouraging the people with the skill sets that we require when we require them to come over, but then also to stay on, to stay on Ireland. Like I said, we need to, to move to a stable population, but also what, what I'm interested in is, um, at the moment, there's lots of impact assessments that the state assembly is required to do when they launch, when they lodge propositions. And I, I personally would be in favor of a population impact assessment. Okay. I think, I think right. we need to think, think through that as well. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I'm trying to try and be as equitable as I can about time. Neil, um, in terms of uh, the population that we have and stable population, it's a really interesting subject because you don't want a decreasing population. That's very damaging for an island um, and, and, and very da- not sustainable, um, whereas uh, large spikes are not sustainable either. But we, we've got an ageing population uh, that uh, uh, all experts tell us mean that they're going to cost more. And I say they, I include myself in that, in that aging population and many others. Um, we're gonna have more people not working than working within the next few years. That needs, that, that we've got to balance the books on all of that to ensure that there's enough in the pot to look after people. So how do we manage that stable level population? That's a real, real difficult conundrum. Right. Well, 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 first of all, your, your issue about spikes is, is, is interesting. Uh, I, I run a temp agency which uh, supplied a lot of people to uh, businesses over here. And uh, as we saw, when there was no work, the, the migrant workers went. Because as much as Jersey is beautiful, beautiful and lovely to us, it's also extremely expensive if you're not from here. So, so workers are here to work. When there's work, they will work. When there's not, they will go, okay, unless there's a tremendous social system that's in place for them, which, which there hasn't been until yet. So uh, that, that's, that's one issue. Uh, yes, we have a massive issue with an aging population, but that is the same around the world. Not exactly the same, but the, the healthcare system is making sure that people live longer. Uh, in the UK, they extended pension, uh, uh, pension age to 67, etc. So I think there's a lot of issues that we aren't going to resolve now just by hoping that we've got an idea or two. Uh, they, they are big cyclical changes that we're going to have to address because there are an awful lot of uh, the aging population uh, that, that retire. Some of them are retiring on um, defined benefits, which means that they've got quite a nice life, thank you very much, for as long as they want. Uh, and with, uh, the healthcare system is making sure that people do live longer and as they survive one illness, they tend to survive the next because we've got better and better healthcare, which is, of course, where we want to be. So it's, you can't get a glib, straightforward, two-minute answer out of this, on this. This is way more complicated. We need to see those. I, I see lots of skilled, very, very capable people uh, who, who are retiring. And yet they, the likes of them you know, the, uh, sh- should be looking at being in the States to help out. But, you know, they don't. So uh, I'm not saying we won't get all the old people to run the states. That's not what I was suggesting for one sec. But what I'm saying, there are skills and capabilities out there that we need to take advantage of and not just put sort of assume because they've got past the age of 65 that they aren't a, a functioning adult anymore. But that that the, the ability for us to pay Social Security, which is, as we know, is not really a fund. It's more a matter of uh, uh, Robin Peter to pay Paul. Uh, we, we need younger people here and we need higher incomes uh i I suggest that we we, we, you know finance has lost its uh momentum and we need a replacement it is a brilliant business finance it's low impact for the economy uh, for the environment very well paid people but it's it we're we're assuming it's going to last forever and we're also uh assuming that it will always pay as well as it has it may not and we need to find alternatives which there are plenty of global businesses out there which have a low light, low impact. So there you go. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I've got two to come back to, and I'm going to Julie first on this first one. Uh, Julie, population. Uh, we've, we, we've just been hearing about uh, the, the, the nine months not working, too short for some, uh, some needing two years. We're, I'm hearing in hospitality uh, that uh, hotels want to open all year round, and yet they've got to say goodbye to some of their uh, staff after nine months. Uh, so we, we've got some difficulties there. Some of them are linked, of course, uh, to the uh, Brexit and the visa applications, which adds another layer of complication. Uh, but how do we, if, if, if there are things we can, you, you could change with the population policy, what would you change? I like the idea of sustain and train. We've got a lot of people on this island, young people that don't maybe want to go to university. I didn't go to university. Um, We can do more training on island. We can get the skills to come in 
and to train on Ireland. We have Highlands College, which is brilliant. We've got some very talented people. We've got retired people, quite right, that may be bored, that may come in and start helping the younger generation. We all need to engage together. This is not just an elderly problem, and nor is, is it just a population problem. It's a problem for all of us to find out a solution to how this island, nine by five, which isn't growing, how are we going to solve it? We've got retired people that would love to come back and do some training part-time. We don't need everyone to have degrees. Not everyone needs a degree. We've got great people that have left the island that would love to come home. We've really got to engage as a community and work together. And as Neil said, there is no quick fix on this. It's taken years to create this situation. It's gonna take at least this term, whoever's in, to sort it out. And I know that we, JLC and the Progress Party, if in, will get this job done. But we certainly need to listen because at the hospitality hustings, it's very clear. Business is doing its job. We as a government need to help them and we need to move fast. The idea of the nine month um, permit works to a certain extent but if you've got someone that's done nine months and that employer thinks they are fantastic there should be a quick turnaround for that individual between a one to two year permit similar to australia we can make it our jer jersey the jersey way that works for us but certainly a permit situation to help business which will help the population which will help all of us that are getting older and let's stop putting down the elderly. You know, we're all going to get old. Let's embrace those that are retired and let's help each other get this job done. And let's get on with it. Trust me, some of us are already old and getting older by the minute. Uh, but, but I appreciate what you're saying. Um, in terms of what you're saying is there's, there's, there's untapped markets within our own island already. Absolutely, 100%. Okay. Um, um, I'm just going to quick, quick point. Um, I yeah. was offered a big paid job in Rome. I was there to do a job to train. I train the locals and it works. It absolutely works. We have fantastic talent on Ireland. Let's get on with it. Fine. Uh, talent on Ireland, John, uh, but not all talent is on Ireland and we still need to bring some in. Um, it, it's been described, uh, the population policy that we've been living with for the last 12 years, uh, by some as a, a bit of a free-for-all. That's why we've had the spike. Uh, it's also been described as a Ponzi scheme in terms of you can only keep bringing people in for so long uh, and they just keep growing the population. So how do we manage that? Um, you, you've been in business, John, you know how difficult it is to recruit. Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult, but the, difficult, the current difficulty has not got much to do with COVID and the fact that a lot of people left, um, you know, particularly the, the, the Polish nationalities, etc., left during COVID because the, the jobs weren't there, because places were closed. And also, to be fair, the way that the government handled COVID put a lot of people off and, and made them leave the island. But, you know, get back to the, the, the age crisis that, that people could keep talking about. Why is Jersey lagging behind? I mean, I'm, I'm past retirement age, but I'm still working. I'm, I'm healthy. I'm fit and I intend to carry on. I'm, I'm, look at me. I, I want to get into the States and do some work. I've got plenty of life left in me. So why don't we allow those that can to work a bit longer? And then we're not, not those persons are not such a burden. And, um, you know, this is the situation with, with the percentage of the, pop, uh, the population that get older. There's an assumption that all of a sudden there's more people over 65 and everybody's going to look after them. A lot of them can look after themselves and they should be given that opportunity. And those, could, those people could fill some of these um, jobs in, in certain sectors. So, again, it's down to government to address the issue. Um, again, you know, I'm so disappointed with the lack of the population policy. In the island plan back in 2011, they had a guideline of 350, 325 people per annum to allow in, and they just ignored it. And we had, you know, over the last 10 years, nearly 10,000 more people uh, into the island. I mean, if that continues at that same rate, by 2030, I think we're going to be up to about 150,000 people. Then we've got real problems. So... As with all the discussion today, the first thing we've got to address is, is a population policy. The second is we've got to look after uh, our accommodation and, you know, tied to that, look after, look after workers and give them decent accommodation as well. So more government measures, but done with some speed. 
Okay, we've got 10 minutes left. Uh, time has flown by, an hour and five minutes already gone. Uh, so doesn't time fly when you're having fun? Uh, so we're to uh, a final one minute round of, uh, of topic really, and probably two minutes, I think we can probably allow on this for each. Um, and that is what you see our economy looking like in the next four years. Where do you see the economy in the next four years? There are stresses and strains on the retail industry with online. There are stresses and strains in the uh, hospitality industry, the agricultural industry, the building industry. You can't get a, a, a carpenter or a bricklayer for love nor money. And you certainly, and I have neither. Um, and you, you, the agricultural industry is, is, is straining as well. And finance industry seems to be changing. So how do you see the economy in the next four four years um, and where would you like to see the help put? Um, I don't think we've started with Neil first, so I think we'll start with Neil first this time. Uh, the economy, where do you see it? Uh, fantastic point. It's, uh, if, if we look at the business of Jersey, we've got to make sure that we've got the income coming in. You know, where, where, where are we going to get growth in DT, GDP? We won't do it by employing 1,000 more members into the civil service, which is what we've done over the last few years. OK, we, we can only do it by selling off island or having people come here. Uh, so uh, for me, we need to strengthen all the broader sectors of the economy just so that our children have somewhere else to go and uh, something else to do besides finance. Finance is absolutely brilliant. We need to encourage it. We need to see if it can come up with more products, more ideas, more ways of making sure that we've got income coming into Jersey. But we need to deal with, as I say, low impact businesses, uh, environmental impact businesses, such as uh, I, I don't know what's going to happen with uh, blockchain. Nobody really does, but we could be at the forefront of some industries like that. It, knowledge industries, uh, they're, they're the things that we need to look at. We need to encourage people to the island. Are we going to do it in four years? Well, God knows. We're, you know, we're, we're, we're going to have to think like a business and make it happen. Think like a business. That's what the States has got to do. Uh, let's go. John next. John, uh, how are we going to, uh, what's, what's the economy going to look like? Um, and, you know, part of that economy is St. Helier. It's the big driver as, as, as the parish. So, uh, is our economy going to change? And if it is, what can you do as a states member to change it? Well, I've been in business for over 50 years and I, my business keeps changing all the time. And you've got, you've got to move with the times. You can't just stand still and think, oh dear, you know, if we're not doing so well, it'll, it'll improve. It doesn't improve. You've got to make your business improve. And I've certainly over the last couple of years looked at costs and I've negotiated, renegotiated uh, some of our costs where I can, obviously with landlords. Some of our costs are, you know, more, more, more difficult to control the cost of electricity. So what we've done, we've, in, we've improved our, um, our efficiency by putting LED lighting in instead of the old fashioned tube lighting, that sort of thing. So retail needs to adapt, but um, it's not just COVID, it's obviously Amazon, but the high street should be streamlining itself and looking to improve. And getting back to the central market, I mean, there, there is a, a prime example of something, as Neil said, we're still stuck in last century. We need to modernise the central market and, and the individual market. We can make that a fabulous place. There's, there's places in the UK that have been turned into really interesting uh, old markets that have been turned into local, local interest, eatery places that people gather and eat and have their coffee and um, you know, they can have all sorts of food and eat in the central area. There's lots of ideas. And in fact, there's a lot of investors out there that, that would get involved. Um, street theatre. You know, allowing um, more street theatre, and I'm not just talking about people strumming a guitar, a guitar, but there's all sorts of, of, of ideas for street theatre to bring some life back into St. Helier. As regards um, businesses, finance needs to become more green. You know, green finance is a thing of the future, and that's, you know, finance that isn't involved with the fossil fuel industry, etc. I mean, the government itself needs to cut, cut its ties. It's got more, it's too much investment in in fossil fuels with its uh, rainy day fund, so that needs addressing. There's new and, and, and upcoming industries as we move to uh, our farming um, industries, looked at regenerative chemical free farming, now a more diversity of crops. So instead of monoculture and just growing New Jersey Royals everywhere, and then, you know, they're, they're, there's compromise by price because you see them cheaper in supermarkets in the UK. You should, you should look at diversifying uh, crops for the farming industry. So di diversifying the economy is where we should be. Diversifying the economy, not all the eggs, all in one basket. Um, I think it's Julie's turn next. Our island is nine by five. It's a beautiful, beautiful island. We need to diverse 
and we need balance. We've got green fields, we've got brown fields. The green ones, we know that hospitality will buy an 80 to 100% of the food that's grown locally. Local is great and local is green. As an island, we have to get back to the fact we are a small island. However, local is global. Intellectual property. We can look at um, Digital Jersey, for example, 20 million has been put into it from the government. We as a government have to listen to business. The Chamber of Commerce do a fantastic job. They're talking to businesses all the time. We as a government need to be on the ground listening, making policy that's going to get this show on the ground, off the ground as soon as possible. We can look at event tourism. We can expand the season provided the permits work for business starting from nine to the one to two years on the people that the businesses need. We can train, we can sustain our island, but we must work together. The countryside and the town need to be kind to each other and we need to work together. And JLC with the Progress Party is exactly the party to vote for. We can do it if we get the chance. So in short, we need to balance our island that's nine by five so we all have a good value of life and prosperity for all backgrounds, all ages. Thank you. Thank you, Julie and Lindsay. Uh, our economy, and we look ahead to the next four years of our economy, and I think you know, anyone who's in business is, is slightly in, in intrepidation at the moment of what the next four years is going to bring. I don't expect any of you to have a crystal ball, but in terms of what you feel reform can bring to the economy, um, what do you see as the way forward? Um, are you, going back to your original question about where we'd be in four years time, I'd, what I'd really like to see is um, us utilising the skills that, that we have here and just to bust another myth about Reform Jersey, um, we are not anti the finance industry. What we would like to see in four years time is us being you know, that centre of excellence for green finance, um, using all of the skills and the knowledge that we have here to, um, you know, to deliver that, um, green, those green initiatives within finance. Um, and also what we've got is our internal economy as well. And um, it is important that we support uh, farm, our farming community to, um, so that we do have our, our own food security on island as well, um, but also look towards moving to more organic farming. Um, and again, that, that was one of the in industries when I grew up. We had farming, we had um, tourism. So it would be great to look, look at how we could bring those industries back to life. Um, going back to our comment earlier about the, the eight Jersey in the 80s, Murray, um, it, it would be um, good as well to see some of those um, nightlife and entertainment and um, people need things to do when they live here and arts and cultural um, sector is a really important part of our economy as well. Um, uh, when I was in Australia, I did, I did work on um, creative industries development as well. Um, and creative industries grants programs, looking at specifically industries and how we could develop those industries um, and bring in business. So um, I worked closely with the uh, with with Stream West as well, looking at utilising Western Australia as a location for films, and that type of thing is the thing that we can do on island in Jersey as well. But I don't think the finance se sector is going away anytime soon. And I would hope that we would be able to work with that sector to ensure the prosperity of the island. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we seem to have covered an awful lot of ground in a short amount of time. And I'm very grateful to the candidates that have given their time today for this. Uh, this can be watched again on the uh, Jersey Chamber of Commerce YouTube channel uh, once it's all been uploaded up there, which will take uh, but a couple of hours. And then uh, chamber members will be able to look back and view the candidates on this and the other hustings that we have. Uh, we'll be talking St. Helia South um, uh, tomorrow uh, and St. Helia North for that matter as well. So more on St. Helia tomorrow with the candidates there. Our thanks to Neil Kilby, John Baker, uh, Julie Wallman and of course Lindsay Felton for joining us today. Uh, note that other uh, candidates include uh, Karina Alves, uh, Catherine Curtis, Jeff Southern, Rob Ward, Chris Tangy and Nick Blacornu who weren't attending today. Uh, thank you very much indeed once again all of you for uh, attending.
uh, it's been uh, it's been good to have uh, you with us today and we will look forward again to talking to you uh, and working possibly with some of you uh, in the future from the Jersey Chamber of Commerce. Have a very good morning. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Mary. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.